Hello there everyone, this is I am Mark 3 and welcome to From the Depths for this week's particular little mini-series in which I will be taking uh, general requests that I asked about for the last week on my Discord and I'll take about 20 minutes to design a weapon system based on what was asked for. Unfortunately, no one really weighed in on any of each other's ideas, so this is more or less be going on a random slash what I might find interesting slash la di da di da. So, for this, the first attempt, the first part, I will be working on um, the one requested by Mr. Analog Cog. Yes, Mr. Analog, and I will be working on a. Locked in. Yeah, that's all locked in. Right. I'll be working on a underwater APS system. Mm -hmm. Two, three, four. Yeah, I guess that's okay. Right. So yeah, underwater advanced projectile. Okay, that should be absolutely plenty. So I'm just starting off by getting myself in a very quick ammo storage. Just fill that. There you go. Center of mass sorted. So, this one gives it an ammo supply, ready to roll. So this is not actually part of the weapon system. Let us actually start doing that. We want, um, I guess the most distinctive, quote unquote, part of a underwater advanced projectile system is the munitions involved. Hmm, I was actually looking this up on the forums to see what was going on with it, and the key part of any underwater APS is the inclusion of a super cavitation base piece. First of all, I want to check the nose. Let, let's see. Let's decide the gauge. I don't want this to be too heavy. So, I, I was thinking my target should be about a two meter rack shell. So, uh, 120 millimeter? Yeah, let's make it like um, equivalent to a modern tank shell, shall we? So, like that. The thing that we require, though, as I mentioned, is the uh, Super Cav base. And that is because it is critically important. Again, this is not indicative of the final round. I'm just dropping it down here. One, two, three, four, five, six. That should be relatively good. Six gunpowders and the Super Cav base. So, what happens here is. Actually, what was the thing? Yep, okay. Supercab base. So, this is the key part of any underwater APS system. It removes 90% of the slowdown incurred by water. It also removes entirely the chance of a projectile skimming off water. They lower warhead payloads of standard explosive and frag in the EMP yields by 70 to um, 75%, so that's 25% reduction. The 90% is the significant factor, though. Like, did you know that water reduces the... Um, velocity of a shell going through it by 70% per second it is underwater. That's why shells trail off so severely if they get into the drink. Like 70% for every second. It is quite significant and it does reduce the range somewhat of an underwater APS system. So, we've got to keep that in mind. There is not guaranteed to be a relatively good velocity. So, we want to have some kind of payload based warhead rather than something, you know, like um, a pure kinetic round. That will be... Well, pure kinetic round will get further, but comparatively, an underwater APS is going to have shorter range because, well, flat out, it's going to lose velocity and it's going to arc more severely. Though the 70% reduced to 7% is much more manageable. It is still rather severe at the extent of the range. So it's, it's also much faster than... Um, in air, I believe there is actually no drag at all until it reaches the limits of its effective range and then it drops off incredibly quickly. So what am I thinking? I'm wanting the... Yes. I'm thinking like um, we want to payload one. Remember explosives is reduced. So where is secondary charge? Shapes charge secondary. I'll put that one into here. Shape charge secondary. Then we will add in HE at the front. 100%. 
So this is going to be like an anti-armor, like an armor breaching kind of shell. So H-E, 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 H-E. And at the front we are, rather than the shaped charge, we are going to include... Da -da -da, what was it? A squash head instead. So concentrate all explosives directly into the shockwave and carry interior spelling. So this this is the the squash head is what punches. Well, it creates things based on what it hits. If I recall correctly, unless I'm getting it completely wrong. Yeah, it is. So it does that, and then it will also have a shape charge doing additional stuff behind it. And then lastly, to round it out a little bit, we'll give it a frag head as well. So nice general purpose shell here, fitted for a two meter casing. So should be somewhat useful that, and it's not going to matter too much as far as the underwater stuff is concerned. Now, I've spent like five minutes waffling on about the shell. We need a weapon to fire it. Yeah, uh, new objects, please. Give me a two axis, give me a... Um, let's go five meter. No, let's say three meter. I tend to build for smaller vehicles, and for convenience sake, we'll just set its idle resting to 90 degrees. You'll see why in a second. So close that off. And we need to place in some metal beams of the uh, 3 meter persuasion. Like that. Okay. And the reason I'm doing that is... Well, I'm doing that wrong, actually. <laughs> is I'm designing the weapon system. I'm, I'm, I like the idea of a sub which is kind of... You know, it's somewhat slender, somewhat narrow. I was thinking of maybe doing a... Uh, <laughs> I'm getting distracted trying to focus on the, on the Tetris. Four, one, allow two meters for armoring, and then one and a thing. There we go. So, comparatively not so bad. We will just increase the gauge mounting slightly to the front. And that's why I flipped it 90 degrees, because there's several ways to go about it, but I like my subs to be somewhat cylindrical and somewhat small. So maybe that's personal preference or something like that. Like that, and we are on 120 millimeter for desired gauge. So let's set that up. 120. And we'll go ahead and increase it to, uh, let's say a two-barreled cannon. So, not too shabby. We've got some cooling we need to account for as well, after all. Cooling unit. Now, there was an alternate form I was thinking of maybe going for with this. I'm going to turn that way, that um, upwards just to make sure it's connecting. And that was like, um, I could have done this lengthways, and that, if it's a really slender slug with a high powered gun, that would be rather nice. But, of course, we can't do that. So, APS, we want a mantle. Um, we only need, really, a 1 meter L mantle. We don't need a 3 meter because... This is entirely because we've got the uh, thing double mounted. So, this will take care of rotation around the main body of the craft, so around it. And then, because a submarine can't be guaranteed to be nose forwards, which is why my other design, I didn't want to do that. Because it's not guaranteed, it's... Um, well, let's barrel 4 meter out here, followed by a 4 evac, followed by another 4 meter. I need to double check on the shell for a second, hang on. Hmm. It's got, a submarine is more likely to be circling, so I wanted to make this weapon system able to fully engage from a 90 degree angle. And as a result, it's a comparatively small system, but that means it will fit on a comparatively small sub as well. So it doesn't need to be nose forwards. Not really. So, at 120 meters, 2 meter shell rack, the optimal propellant burn is 4.7 meters, we've got that. Accuracy is 11.6, so short on that, it suffers from an accuracy penalty. 11.6, that's 12 meters, 4, 8, 9, we've already got 9. Let's add one more barrel piece, and then that becomes completely relevant. Alright, good. So, we now have a double barreled 1, 2, 0 rated weapon system. Let us go ahead and give it some auto-loaders of the 2 meter persuasion. Like so. Um, and this is why I built only a stick, so we've, we've got a very simple thing here. Let's just get the uh, 
Of course, we've got to remember that we need to have two ammo inputs per loader for optimum loading rate. Because it generally takes twice as much time to pass from the clip to the weapon than it takes for to grab it from the sorry to generate it from the actual ammo stocks of the ship itself. So two of those goes into one of those. And then we've got a total of eight of those. Eight shells ready and racked to fire. And that is good. Though we can also increase this thing slightly out of the sides as well. If we wanted to add another 12 rounds, we just have to increase the silo size from a 3x3 one to a 5x5. So, you know, not too bad, not too bad. We can do that relatively well. And in fact, might as well. We're keeping this somewhat flat here. Admittedly, this is, like, pretty ugly. There's no real Tetris involved. So... Apologies if it offends anyone who is thinking like, um, hmm, that doesn't look too good, but it's, it's keeping the ratio of having one autoloader per two ammo intakes. So technically this is three three shells ready to roll. So it's because it's got um, the one in the autoloader loaded and ready to rack straight into the cannon. And it's also got two intakes which are ready to supply a shell immediately straight to the autoloader. So that is going to be quite handy there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's looking fairly well. It's nice and basic. And it, of course it, it allows for 2 meter armor protection here. Just above for the shell itself. Though for 5 wide I should have mounted this one slightly further forward. I must admit to that one. Uh, let's save this sub object and quickly move it. Overwrite the turret of the slender battleship for a turret of the vehicle and switch it forward just so we can get slightly better positioning since I've decided to make this one slightly bigger. So slightly more, less of, less, of a, less of a light support weapon, more of a weapon of war. There we go. Right. That's looking not too bad, isn't it? Yes, indeed. So let's actually go ahead and hop over and take assu assume direct control. Yes, let's as assume direct control. And now you can see why it was like, um, why I've got it mounted on that, because it can rotate itself to adjust it. Also remember, by the way, this turret is defaulted at 90 degrees, so it's, it's pointing that way right now. But it wasn't working properly because I only have control of the rear mount. So what I need is a chair and a FCS. So sit in that. That'll give me full control. And will allow this entire thing to just twist like that. So now you see why I only put the one meter adjustable in. Because the side mounted turret will automatically spin it around. So that it's generally pointing in the right direction. And then the uh, one meter elevation piece will allow for fine tuning. So now we're just checking the reload on it. Compa fairly slow, actually. I think we need a slightly better cooldown than that. We've got 4.4 seconds. We can definitely do better. So, what we'll do is we'll trade uh, two of the ammo sockets, two clips, well, um, some of the ammo firing capability for some additional cooling racks up the side, just for a bit of extra sustain there. Touch it up a little bit. There we go. No, so it just pops over to the side immediately as soon as we try to do that. But yeah, 2.9. Every three seconds, it lobs out one of those anti-armor shells, which is not too bad at all, all things considered. Could probably benefit from, um, well, underwater shielding tends to be a bit on the light side, unless you're against another submarine. It's not really geared for anti-submarine, anti-shield warfare, I should say. But it's a nice generic weapon system, all told. If I go to the uh, actual thing here and I mirror it upwards, like that. And I'll replace those beams with four meter ones. Now, we can go ahead and just, you know, create the silo to house it, that should be good. Like that, Is does that stop it? Oops, no, the other way. Nope, that allows it full rotation, quite happily. And we can just very easily wrap a silo around it like that. Not too shabby at all. So yeah, you can see what I'm doing here. So 
that'll be like that. And then we've got um, the standard for a two for a uh, recessed turret. We have a two meter neck available. Well, at least that's my standard. <laughs> I don't know about anyone else, but that is my standard, so... I like to have a 2 meter neck, and then we will have... So this will be embedded in the armoring of the silo itself. And then on the top, it is time to add in the turret cap, which I will also start to include. Gotta remember this is underwater. And since it's actually a spin block on a spin block, that means that it's... Um, that means that its collision is, I, I believe, disabled under current game mechanics so I'm not too sure if that's actually required. But we want it to be nice and pointy looking, you know? Because it's underwater, and it's got to look aggressive. Yeah, it's just got to look, look aggressive. Look very, very aggressive. And I might as well take advantage here and include a, a couple of minor recoil stabilizers too. So, uh, that's a bit too large, shall we say? Let's drop it to a couple of two meters. And, yeah, a couple of two meters behind it as well. Yeah, that's okay. So that's doubled up. That's giving it some basic recoil. And then the rest can be just like quite quite nicely and neatly metal armored with a two meter wedge on the front. Just to make sure that it is afforded some built-in protection, shall we say. And then, of course, we need to have a little bit here. So that's sort of beam three on that side. And then it drops down to beam twos, just around the sides. And the rear of the cap is gonna be pretty standard, honestly. We can actually squeeze, let's just squeeze in an additional two meter and call it a day. So, box, metal block, beam three. And we might as well just round it out just to make it look nice and pretty. No, we want the square corners, actually. Square corner. So it looks like something you might see on an actual submarine. Though, of course, you've got to remember that this system does also suffer from a major, another major weakness of um, submarines. If you're relying on detection systems, you're only guided by sonar. Most of the more accurate stuff doesn't work. So, this system is not going to be as accurate as a above-surface weapon system unfortunately and you can't do a darn thing about it so it's, uh, it's a shame but it's also something you've got to just live with when you're working with an underwater APS and that's another reason why you need to get a bit closer it's not going to be <sighs> how should I put this you're not going to get a sniper to it let's put it that way a sniper system is not gonna work for you not on an underwater APS if you wanted kilometer ranges and things like that, then you either need to be very lucky, honestly, or you need to actually have a spotter. Because any such sensor data has to come from somewhere else. So I'm just like mocking up the silos slightly. Actually, I should use a downslope for this sometime. I'm just mocking up the cage for the uh, thing. So it would go like that. And the uh, the entire point is, of course, that this system is freely rotating. So, press the key. Let's grab the turret again. I will save it once again as a new turret. And we will once again do this. So we will complete what I was setting out to do and create a companion piece on the other side of the thing. I've got to get this right. Is that all correct? Mm, oh, 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 I've got something out of slight, slightly out of place. That's okay. So something like that. And with that now in place, of course, we can now reset this thing back to absolute zero. So your idle, idle thing can now be zero once again. So it rotates to its flat orientation as before. So now we've developed this um, central thing. It spins around its shared point quite happily, honestly. And then for the overall submarine design, it will just like continue on. We build something like this. Like this is how it's intended. This replaces the outer hull because it's an entire spinning section. And then light blocks would 
give an anchor point through to the other side of the magazines and the system. And then the rest of the submarine would just continue on just in front of it, something like that. So it would essentially act as a breakpoint in the actual submarine design itself. So it's, you know, just like that. So if I was to design an underwater APS system, that is uh, kind of what I'd do for it. And then when I want to target in this direction, it will automatically rotate and shift to shift both weapons to fire in that general direction. Just like that, you see. It's comparatively... It fires at a comparative speed, so it's okay. Decent refire. So, the last thing to do is to test it. Let's get in my favourite test subject, a Marauder. Turn off the AI. And then we will also apply... Let's apply a little bit of turn to this thing. So, please rotate me to 20 degrees. So, there we go. And we'll, we'll also kick in the ACB block here. And I want the pistons to extend to full stretch. Which will sink my test platform under the water like so. So, as you see, the enemy is over that away. I kick in the turret. And the entire thing will rotate around like that. And it'll point both turrets quite nicely towards the target. Which is exactly why I was not setting it up for... You know, I didn't bother with the three meters because the uh, the axial rotation on the design will take care of that. So there we go. Now, unfortunately, the lack of accuracy does mean that it's um, having to cope without useful things like uh, tracers. Tracers would be useless underwater because of the slowdown that they would experience. So, you know, not too bad. And the individual hits are doing. A fair bit of damage. But you've got to remember though, this thing is kind of geared towards punching through some heavier armour. Rather than rather than something lighter like this, so it's maybe not the best performance. But feel free to modify the shell type, so you know. The the only crucial component in the shell type is purely the uh, cavitation base. And as you can see, it is actually doing some rather nasty things to it. Let, let's hit the uh, below the water line over here. But yeah, as you can see, there is barely any arc going on. So while the shells are losing velocity, they have enough to engage effectively in this kind of range. And they're not really scattering too much, so they are fairly accurate as well in this configuration. Certainly enough to deal with lighter targets. But yeah, the key part of this entire arrangement though, in how I would build an underwater APS system, is entirely this... Um, this axial based rotation followed by the double individual turrets which can now be angled to any any attack vector that might be required though something like this you you really want to employ things like um oop, well the marauder's a little bit dead the shells have got there in the end <laughs> so yeah they can do, they can work fairly well Yeah, not too bad. That was my train of thought. Oh yeah. Um, for something like this, if you're wanting to have wider points of the design, you might want to... Well, um, a failsafe will not really work too well with this. So what you really want is to go straight into the thing and enable rate of the firing angle constraints. Just to restrict it from angling in a certain way. So like, say you have a big wide bit here you don't want it to be shooting at. You don't have to worry about things in a roughly straight line, though the angling, it's possible to angle like that if need be, if you're straight behind something, so it depends on the length of the craft. You might want to include a bit of restriction in the elevation though, so, sorry not the elevation, the azimuth. Um, yeah, this one. So, like say, if I angle it like that, then this particular turret won't engage in that general direction. So yeah, can be a bit confusing here, but you want to use the uh, the angling restraints to stop it from targeting certain things. Still, there you go, ladies and gents. That is my take on how to build an underwater advanced projectile system. 
a little bit quirky, a little bit... Uh, can be a little bit finicky in terms of getting it set up properly, but by and large, the result is a fairly flexible cannon, I would say. So, you know. Especially since it just um, it just re-angles itself as required. But yeah, that's all I have to say about it. And I know that this has gone for 25 minutes, not 20 minutes, but, you know, this is FTD design. FTD designing things always overruns in some way. So yeah, this is Brian Mark III. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed the show, and I hope this has given you maybe an idea or two. I don't know. And I'll catch you all some other time. Yes, indeed. The only dis disadvantage really is that it can't just idly spin both turrets. It actually actually spin the, se the center line turret as well. So, you know, that's one slight drawback of this arrangement. But it's okay apart from that. So, yeah. See you all later.